It's really yes, um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot uh, for being here. I think we're going to have a little bit of a, we are running behind like 10 minutes or so. So we have to, to we're going to readjust a little bit. There's also from uh, a little bit of a few presentations that won't be uh, uh, given in the 3A and 3B if I got it right. But uh, we, we are going to this uh, a little bit later. So. Um, I was told to say a big thank you to all uh, the sponsors of each session, and I think this session is very hoiser. Um, and having organized pro uh, conferences, I know that um, you're really happy if you have money so you can get the costs down, um, and that's quite important. So I'm really happy that uh, I can introduce you to our next plenary speaker, uh, Brian Callos. Um, He's senior professor at the National Institute of Applied Statistics in, uh, at the University of Wollongong in Australia. And uh, um, if I get it right from his bio, he has more than 40 years of experience as a biometrician, which I think is really long. It's almost all my life. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> so mo 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 most people that are working actually in, uh, in breeding know A.S. Rammel, and uh, Brian is uh, sort of responsible, co-responsible for, for this program. And I have to admit that well, his interest in, in developing this tool and in mixed linear model analysis and so on is really helpful for a big community, not only tree breeding, but also animal and crop breeding uh, all use uh, those tools. And I think it's really inspiring. So just please welcome Brian uh, for the next talk. I'm uh, thank, very thank, thankful for that lovely introduction. I'm also extremely grateful to be here again, back in Canada. I love Canada. I love coming to Canada. I brought Alison, my wife, um, has never been to Canada before, so she's super excited to come. And I can't I can't uh, tell you how exciting it is for me to be here again after 10 years. I gave a presentation and a workshop at Whistler, I believe, in 2013. Alvin just Googled it for me just to make sure I didn't make a mistake. And uh, that was a great meeting, and this one so far has been superb. It's been amazing. Um, so, yeah, so I am sort of co-responsible for AS Rimmel. Um, sometimes I'm slightly embarrassed about that. Well, actually, mostly. Uh, so there's good and bad, because um, we can, you know, the good thing about AS Rimmel now is, is that the thing is starting to die a slow death because its uh, engineering was done in the 90s. And so, uh, so now at least you don't get the wrong answer fast, you get the wrong answer slower, so that's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so anyway, uh, enough of that. Um, today's talk is going to be about another project that I'm super, super uh, keen on. And um, the unsung hero of all this work is the second author on that slide, who's one of the most genuine, smart, um, self-effacing chaps I know. And sadly, Dave was going to come along and give the other talk I'm giving, which is on our um, open source replacement for AS Rimmel, which, uh, which we believe is quite good. But uh, the proof will be in the pudding, obviously. But David's PhD um, was under my supervision, and he got, got through it somehow. And from that, we spawned this um, thing called ODW. ODW stands for Optimal Design Dash Wollongong. I had to explain <laughs> to you what it was about. The reason why we had to add the W at the end of it is because um, is because there's an R package out there called OD. So we thought, uh oh, <laughs> before we put this on CRAN, we better give it a, a name that's not going to be a conflict. And um, I don't know about in, in Canada and elsewhere, but in Australia, there's a very, very scary trend to people forget, to forget about experimental design. I, I give um, grad courses in experimental design, and Alison and I have, have given a Fisher talk uh, a few years ago on, on experimental design. It's very, very close to my heart, because we have spent, I've spent a long time, as, as you said, analysing experiments that are flawed. And the design has been flawed, people forget about it, and these days, it's getting worse rather than better, it would seem. Data science, you know, data mining. Um, it seems as though design's becoming something that's passe. Um, not in my world. Anyway, the great thing about ODW now, which I think is, a, is the key thing that sets it apart, it's still embedded strongly in the principles of design, 
which date back to Fisher. Uh, but now we can do things that Fisher probably would have wanted to do, but wasn't able to do because he didn't have the computing. And so ODW allows us to incorporate genetic relatedness into the design phase. Okay, and so the whole paradigm of, oh, I didn't move forward. Do I point there? Ah, is that the first slide or have I gone? No, that's right. So first of all, let me thank all of the people who've been trying out and motivating these ideas that we're presenting today. Uh, we work, as Alison has told you, with a lot of people back in, in Oz. We don't, uh, we mainly work with people who are in um, inbred crops. And there's a lot of people who've been, as I say, working with us to develop and help me test out these ideas, myself and Dave and Alison. <coughs> but today, I've had to take a step out of my comfort zone, uh, a bit more than Alison has done. And I've actually now tried to take on something which has been a bit scary for me, to go back into the tree world of, um, uh, yeah. And so, special thanks to Marie and Alvin for using their um, progeny test uh, multi-environment trial design in today's talk. So, as we know, there's been huge advances in the, in the analysis of multi-environment trials, uh, which encompass all stages of uh, selection in a plant improvement program. In your case, life is much harder for you people. Uh, and experimental design, for me, becomes more important, clearly. I was talking to somebody at, uh, over lunch, and um, obviously, if you're a tree geneticist, you can only design one experiment in, in your lifetime, in your career. <laughs> And you can only analyse one data set in your career. <laughs> whereas, um, whereas the people that we deal with do it every year. And they get it rather easily, by comparison, I think. Or maybe not. Uh, we also know for some time that factor, these FALMMs, provide a pretty good fit to, uh, to MET data. Uh, most uses of the FALMMs uh, incorporate some form of relatedness in the analysis, as uh, we know, either through the NRM or the GRM. And then more recently, we've been doing some work around summary measures, which we believe are useful tools. So maximal gains from the use of factor analysis in the analysis uh, will occur only if the MET data set has been constructed and designed in an appropriate manner. And uh, a student of, of Allison's, uh, Chris, Bryan, uh, Chris Lyle, um, has been studying that, uh, that issue, and he, and he has come up with some really good results, really cool results which basically underpin a lot of what we're talking about in this, uh, in today's talk. Um, given the fact that you, uh, if you've got a multi environment trial, that there are some key, key properties which are crucial for you to be able to properly fit these models to these data sets and be confident about it. Classical uh, approaches to design, like um, incomplete block designs or alpha designs and those sorts of things, uh, are incapable of constructing optimal designs which include relatedness, and cater for the constraints which exist uh, in designing METs, which is, which is the reason why we go to this uh, level of comp complexity. There are numerous issues back home that we have to work with in Australia, where we have uh, limited seed supply in early stage testing in the first test uh, for all sorts of reasons, resource allocation constraints, size of trials, number of plots, and then sometimes there are restrictions in terms of the allocation of genotypes to across sites. And most of these issues, I believe, are also shared, well, I hope so, I believe so, are shared by forestry breeders. But please let me know if I'm wrong there. Model-based design provides the only sensible framework for the, the construction of designs with des the desirable properties. The paradigm is to use a computer-intensive search of a thing that we talk about, which is a very nebulous term, of a design space. To search that space, and it's a huge space typically, of order n squared, n being the number of trees, uh, to generate an optimal design with respect to a pre-specified analysis model. Okay, so the, the paradigm here is whatever you, you're planning to use for the analysis of your, of your experiment, or MET trial, whatever, is that you really want to try and match that in generating your, your design. If you do that, then it's most likely that you're going to get the highest heritability of the target selection. ODW is a freely available, well, will be a freely available, at the moment it's not, but it will be, uh, R package which constructs optimal designs under the LMM framework and can generate designs for a whole range of problems. You can still use it to generate Latinized row column designs or alpha designs if you wish, without, with or without relatedness, it's fine. 
You can generate these partially replicated designs that I published in 2006 with or without relatedness. Designs for additive effects, which is what we're going to do today. Um, incomplete met designs. People love to use this word sparse phenotyping. I don't like it myself. But sparse phenotyping designs appear to be quite sexy these days. And essentially, sparse phenotyping designs are what, what we've been doing for about 10 years without really calling them that. And if you want to do selective phenotyping, we can also do that. OK, for this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate some of the ideas uh, using ODW, uh, where I use relatedness in forestry genetics. And there's two, two little situations that we'll deal with. I hope I have time to get to the MET design. The MET design doesn't come at a cost. It's very, very, it's reasonably complicated. Um, I had a workshop yesterday, uh, which I think hopefully got a couple of the principles through. <laughs> I don't know, we had some technical failures. But I'm going to start with a single, single experiment design. One trial, one environment. We're going to start really slow so I can hopefully get some of the key ideas across without the complexity of doing a MET design. So we're going to use a reduced animal model, which is what uh, appears to be the norm, to generate an optimal design for the prediction of additive effects with varying numbers of seedlings per family. Sorry about the typo. OK. so. This is all from Marie's uh, first test. It's a ponderosa pine first cycle progeny test design, which is a bit of a mouthful. I have to think of an acronym for that. The aim to test progeny from cone collections across, and I apologize if I get some of the, the nomenclature wrong here. I should get Marie to give the data description, because I'll make a bit of a mess of it, obviously. But uh, I'll try my best. So Marie has collected uh, cones from across BC and 16 national forests, I believe, in. In, uh, in the US, and they've been divided into 143 zones. I think we will refer to them as female origins in this talk. Her plan, <coughs> her plan is to do a first uh, progeny test, first cycle progeny test across 15 trials across three years, uh, within, with five types, five sites per year. The 15 sites have been classified into seven, so, sorry, the, yeah, that's right, the 15 sites have been classified into seven so called site types. Marie um, did a comprehensive uh, PCA analysis on the sites based on climate variables. And so I'm, uh, so I'm aware of that, that underpinning uh, factorial structure to the 15 trials. But for, for today, I'm going to ignore the factorial structure and I'm only going to focus on uh, constructing a MET design for years one and two. And I'll ignore for the moment, because I, know, I think I know how to do a better design with a factorial structure for the environments. Well, I'm just going to treat environments as the combination between of years and sites or site types. Okay. All right. The genetic material for years one and two. Uh, there's a total of three fifty-two families that have been constructed, and I believe Marie's got the seeds uh, got the little seedlings growing at this uh, as we speak. Uh, each with sufficient seed seedling trees for the met. So the, I think uh, roughly. But I found out yesterday that that's not entirely true. I was assuming that Marie was living in a perfect world where she had 120 seedling trees per family. Well, that's not the truth, <laughs> which, is, which is what I sort of half suspected but didn't really have the, have the guts to ask. But anyway, so Marie's world is similar to the, to the world that we operate in back home where there are varying numbers of seedlings per family. You just can't avoid it, OK? But as a, as a statistician, I love, I love to use every available seedling, if I can. If somebody's got enough seed for one packet, I'd love to use it. So the breeders come to me and they go, oh my gosh, I've got trouble. I've got some varieties, some genotypes with one packet, and I've got some with 20 packets. What can I do? Well, I say, oh, well, this is going to be fun. We can do the whole lot. We can include everything. I don't want to waste one genotype, because genotypes are the bottom line. Genotypes are the, are the thing that you've got to maintain. <clears throat> and, in a, and in a MET trial, you've got to maintain sites. You've got to maintain as many families across sites as you possibly can. Two really key prospects. And they're the drivers behind what we do. So I don't like to waste one, one seedling from one family. We try and get them all in as much as we can. <clears throat> Hence the issue of, you know, different numbers of uh, seedling trees per family. Okay. Whereas... In the old-fashioned world, we'd always think about equal replication. We'd cut them back and do all that sort of stuff. Cones were, uh, collect, uh, were collected in situ. They're either in situ um, from 168 fem uh, females or from cone cutting planted in one of the seven seed orchards. And there were 180 
four of those, I believe. We've also got 10 control families, which means that we finished up with 362 families. Okay, the design parameters and the current philosophy, <coughs> which is what Marie sort of went to me with her proposal. And fortunately, Marie and I now seem to know each other a bit better, so I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable about giving this story. Oh, there's Marie. <laughs> if I say something really, throw something at me, okay? <laughs> if I say something bad, please do. Um, 10 environments, 4,800 4, single tree plots per environment, 48,000 plots across the full med, okay? That was what was planned, 10 sites, or 10 environments. 24 trees per family, and then straight away, I come from a world where 24, where replication of 24 trees per family, I think, what the, what the, this is bizarre. Why is there so, so many, you know, I can't, can't believe it. We have, we have no replication sometimes, or 10% or 20%, or or like, it's just a different situation. Uh, driven by practical and logistical constraints, Marie's um, original proposal was to choose 28 connected families, or connector families, be deployed at all environments. Uh, control families to, to be deployed at all environments, and the remaining one, uh, 324 families to be split across two cohorts, with 162 being in um, year one, and another 162 being in year two. And instantly, that, I, that didn't sit well with me. I thought, oh, I don't like this, I don't like this. Because Alison and, and I know, from all of our years of experience with factor analysis, we know that connectivity and numbers of genotypes per site are the two drivers at your ability to be able to fit factor models. And hence, your, your ability to fit them usually then translates into your belief of the results. Okay? And so the big question, or the thing that I was in my head straight away, was is this a statistically efficient design? If not, what's the loss in accuracy? And can we overcome that? And can we improve that? OK. Females are so-called base individuals. You people know this stuff better, much better than me. I've only just sort of got into it lately. Trevor's been great, very, very generous, uh, sharing his uh, reports with Alison. And we introduced this uh, genetic groups via phantom parents. Um, I won't spend too long on the details. What we've done to create some sort of uh, pedigree structure or genetic relatedness, since the females are all base individuals, what we've done is we've produced, we've replace unknown parents of the base females by phantom parents, which were the origin of the cone collection. But we also use it at another level, where we've uh, introduced, um, we've replaced the unknown male parent. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, we've, re we've replaced the unknown male parents uh, within a family by its female location. So it's either, uh, if it was collected in the wild, it's a wild stand, which is the origin. And if it was grown in an orchard, then it was the female location. All right, that's a bit of a schmozzle, but hopefully you get the gist of it. So in the notation of uh, while I can read, the size of this A star, this the numerator relation, this extended constructed uh, numerator relationship matrix, which includes all the phantom parents as well as the um, males and females, it's 522 by 522. There's 67 phantom parents that don't appear as parents in the trees in the Met. Dave's got this really cool package called Pedicure, which has got all these really, really cool tools for creating numerator relationship matrices, K matrices, all sorts of cool tools. One of the things we find is really, really computationally useful is to try and uh, just reduce the size of the, of the relationship matrix down to a, to a smaller size as you can. And in this case, the smallest size of the relationship matrix that you can deal with is 455 by 455, which happens to be 362 plus 93 phantom parents. So that's just a trick, computational trick, to speed up uh, the design process. So let's start simple. Let's, let's do one site and we'll do a design for a single environment loosely based on that PY met. 4,800 plots, 362 families, 10 controls, blah, blah, blah. Okay. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, bring in this concept of different levels of replication for the different families. And it's constructed because it's not what, what, it's not what Marie was going to do, but it's more or less what I might have been wanting to do myself. 24 trees um, for, the 20, for the control families and 28 of the non-control families. The remaining 324 families will have 12 trees. And this, this, this idea introduces a new concept that we refer to as a resource optimised design. I don't know of anywhere else in the literature where I've seen this, and I don't believe it's been done before, <coughs> but it basically brings in, a, in, a, in another step into the design process where you're 
using relatedness to tell you how to allocate resources, assuming one can, okay? Assuming it's possible to have uh, choice in the resource allocation, what we're gonna do or show here is that we can actually do something a little bit cute uh, rather than just random allocation. We can, we can let ODW find an optimal design or an optimal resource allocated design for us. So um, in a paper that we've submitted, we introduced these designs and we, apply it, we applied it in that paper to um, these partial replicated designs. Here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the same ideas to produce a resource optimized design. Um, and it involves two stages. Stage one, as I said, is the allocation of the tree seedling status, mouthful, TSS, that is either 12 or 20, 24 trees to a family. And TSS is synonymous with the number of plots that'll be in the final experiment. Okay. Um, stage two is the thing that people normally think about, ah, oh, I'll generate an alpha design, or I'll generate an incomplete block design. So stage two is, is allocation of plots to families, given, given what I've done in stage one. So given the allocation of number of uh, seedlings or whatever, plots if you want, to families, then I can generate an optimal design from that. And each stage of this uh, uses a different call to ODW. Okay, now a little bit of ODW speak. Um, we start with a, an initial configuration, which is just a data frame. The initial configuration has to respect um, the characteristics of the design that you want to generate. But other than that, it's, it, there's nothing clever about it. You've got to define a set of permute factors, and that means um, simply uh, is that the, the permute factors comprise objective functions and link func fun uh, factors, but in, today, in today's talk, I'm only going to be talking about permute factors, uh, and it's like a treatment factor. So here, families are, families are the permute factor. It's what we're going to swap around in the experimental design to find an optimal allocation. And then there's a set of static factors. Typically, they're just things that are like blocks uh, and incomplete blocks and that sort of stuff, okay? And those static factors don't get moved around in the design search. And then we need a, a design quali a quality measure, which statisticians call the A criteria, but a plant breeder would like to think of it as a heritability, because it's, e it's equivalent to a heritability, okay? So what we're doing is we're minimizing the A, but we're maximizing the heritability, okay? And then, then, then we have this cute extra level of things where we introduce swap factors. And they tell ODW as to what are the legal interchanges that can be made during the design search. Okay. Right. And basically, that's, I'll go through, I won't go through that in detail, but it just describes the algorithm that, uh, that we do. Is we start with, the, we, uh, we start off the process, N equals one, we calculate the criteria, of the heritability of the initial design. We do a swap, we see if the heritability of the swap is better. We, if it is, we keep it. If we don't, we keep going. And we just keep going, and going, 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 using a uh, clever taboo search algorithm, which is used from oper operation research. The, the details are not critical, okay. All right, what is critical is how do we trick ODW into finding a design that's optimal, okay? And what we do is we start with the RAM model for the data, so there's, there's a pseudo data vector, because we don't observe data until we run the experiment, obviously. So I've used the word pseudo to actually remind all of us, including myself, that the left-hand side is not data, it's pseudo data. But we have the same li uh, linear mixed model. We have, a, we have a mean, we have an additive family effect, we have a Mendelian, we have a non-additive, we have all these plot, we have these blocks and plots, uh, blocks and incomplete blocks, and an error term. Uh, a bit of matrix algebra, T is a half mum plus half dad, usual stuff, okay? F and M are the female and male design matrices. So that's, hopefully, you get the gist of what that is. That's the standard model you would use to analyze a single experiment, I would imagine. Uh, a lot of variance assumptions. I don't know whether I want to go into that too much. Um, but they're all there, and so people, hopefully my slides will be available and people can read them carefully. But the key thing here is, oh, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, the key thing here is uh, A11 is that numerator relationship matrix, and so we, we assume that the additive effects has that variance matrix, okay? And the Mendelian uh, uh, sigma squared A times D22. Uh, in practice, what I, what I do here, uh, it's a good approximation to assume that D22 is a scaled identity, where D22 bar is the mean of the diagonals of that matrix. 
Okay. Now, to form, form a linear mixed model uh, for determining uh, TSS, or three sieving status, what we think about then is reducing the 4800 data frame, we shrink it down to 362 families. And the obvious thing to do there is to do like, like people do in a two-stage analysis, which I hate, but what people do in two-stage analysis is they do a preliminary analysis where they fit families as fixed, they get the family means, and then might do a, a QTL analysis on that. I mean, I, I don't like it, but that's what people do. Um, and so you can think of it as a similar process. We're shrinking down our full data set down to a set of family means, okay? Or what we call blues. And the simple model that we use in this uh, shrunken data frame is an overall mean, and we have the additive uh, breeding values still sitting there, obviously, because they're family means. And we have, a, we have an error term. The error term here is a constructed error term which represents the uncertainty in estimating the family means from that, in that original configuration. Okay. And so this is where the allocation comes in. In this experimental uh, design, in this example, we have two levels of error variation of these family means. They're all unknown, but for the moment we don't have to worry about that. We have either 24 trees where our variance is sigma squared eta on 24, or we have 12 trees for a family and we have sigma squared on 12. So it's a little bit like what happens in, a, in the analysis of a multi-environment trial. We have two levels of error. We have variance heterogeneity coming from different environments. So it's got that, that sort of link. And the initial configuration that OD uses is a configuration which is, um, yeah, which, is valid for, which is valid for the design parameters that I set up, okay? All right, so, so what OD has to do then, therefore is find a, is find a, is do swapping uh, within, what ODW does, don't worry about all that, just basically down here is we have two swap blocks. We have a swap block here which is swap block number one, which is the 352 test families, which are free to be swapped by ODW. Because uh, the test families can have either 12 or 24, but we don't want the control trees to be swapped anywhere from 24. Marie says, let, well, my, well, my assumption is that Marie will want 24 trees for her controls. And so swap block two are the control trees, and there's 10 of them. There's, there's none, none in the 12 tree category. And so ODW is only allowed to do the swaps between those two. So the, the trick here is we're finding an optimal allocation based on family genetic uh, relatedness, okay? Which we do, okay? Now, so, that, so let's assume I've done that. And I don't want to go through the gories of the ODW call. Now we move to the second stage, which is stage two. Given that we've just done that, and we've now got an optimal allocation to families, we can then construct a, a data frame which is, which is in line with what we've just decided. We can then uh, allocate 24 uh, plots to the families that were the lucky ones, and we can do 12 to the remaining test families. And then we just set up a different linear mix model, which is very similar to the linear mix model that we want to use uh, in the analysis, which is basically this one, which is a mean, a family, uh, a male plus, plus a female, a block effect, an incomplete block effect by block, and an error term. The data frame now that we feed to ODW is 4,800 plots, the permute factors are now female plus male, and we use the additive effects of female plus male for the calculation of the criteria. Okay. We're gonna maximize the heritability of the uh, prediction of the uh, breeding values of the, of the females and males. The static effects are those, and there's no swap factor. Okay. We did, I do that too. So let's assume we've done that. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you the impact, basically, which is quite, I hope you'll find it as, as, um, as impressive as I believe it is, or scary, maybe, either or. So what, we, what, what I did here is I've done a little study to show the impact of using genetic relatedness on the design efficiency, this is theoretical design efficiency, uh, of four different designs. And I'm going to denote those uh, designs as plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, and minus, minus. The plus, plus design, um, is the, is the gold standard in my mind, and the minus minus is more like what we currently, what is probably being done out there, okay, at the moment. And so skip that one and that one. Um, just come down to this one here. Uh, the quality of a design uh, is computed using the A criteria. So I, I generate these designs, and then I assess their quality against the, um, the proper models, okay? So it's against, uh, it's against the plus plus design, okay? 
And that's how you theoretically determine how much you've lost by not doing what I believe is the gold standard. So the four design types are plus plus, use relatedness in both stages, which means we, we determine allocation of um, number of trees per family using ODW, using relatedness. We then use relatedness in, in allocating those uh, family supplots or plus of families. And then the plus minus uses relatedness in stage one only, but not in stage two, uh, and so on and so on. And minus minus does not use relatedness in stage one or two. So in stage one, I just choose the uh, resource allocation stage of 12 or 24. I just do that at random to the families, uh, other than the controls, of course. Uh, and I don't use relatedness in the second stage. Okay? In stage two, I use, OD, uh, to use, I use ODW to generate these designs by having fixed family effects and random plot effects. And so, as I said before, the minus minus is attempting to approximate what I believe is the current default in designing project controls. I believe. Okay, the variance parameters I use for the genetic effects, which is what is required by ODW, were provided from uh, Trevor's data set, which is very, very useful, which means we're targeting what we would hope to be targeting. And we want to have the smallest uh, A criteria or the highest heritability. And so we present down here the scaled, the scaled um, A values, if you like, with the reference being naught being the best, because it, it, it's the minimum. And what is really, really interesting and I think exciting is that the plus plus and the plus and the plus minus going down columns where I'm changing uh, the second stage only um, has, a, has a small effect. The biggest effect is resource allocation. And I don't believe anybody is doing resource allocation using relatedness. And I think that's a stunningly important result. And I've now been able to, re that's the same result I've seen now over so many data sets and so many situations where I've either used an, a, a genomic relationship matrix or I've used a pedigree, uh, an a, uh, NR, a GRM or an NRM, that this, we get this result and I've also validated these, these theoretical efficiencies uh, under simulation and, uh, and the results are quite, quite um, encouraging, and very encouraging. And so I think that's probably the point where I can draw a line under this, uh, this talk and probably go home now because the rest of it's going to be even more difficult to understand. Hopefully you've got... Hopefully you've got the gist of what I'm trying to say here. How much time have I got left? Five minutes of questions. Ten. I've got ten, have I? Sorry? Pardon? Sorry? Seven minutes total. Oh, seven minutes to talk. Oh, I thought two minutes. Gosh, I'm going to have to really go fast. Anyway. That's all right. Okay, sorry. I've got 12 slides to go. I shall not go too fast because I really want to get you to understand a little bit about how to do a MET design. Okay, but, but I think that's really very important. Okay, so a MET design. Let's go back to reality or maybe closer to reality. So Marie wanted to do uh, a MET with 48,000 plots. Well, as always, Murphy's Law. Um, the, the, swap, the swap array is stored as a 32-bit integer uh, by ODW, and 48,000 squared sadly exceeds the uh, limit uh, for such, a, for such an, an array. Thanks, Marie. No worries. That's good. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> so while I'm speaking, Dave's not getting any sleep. He's recompiling ODW for, for Marie's design using a 64-bit <laughs> integer array. Anyway, so sadly, I had to cut this down just to show what we can do. Uh, now I've cut it down to 2,400 trees and 10 environments. Still not a bad size design, but you know, it's a bit, gives you, the, gives you the willies if you can't do what you really want to do. But anyway, um, Dave will have it done next week, probably Maria will be able to crank this through. So that's what, that's what we've had to do. Okay. So we illustrate that uh, cut down thing. We'll do 32, this is where I want to bring in uh, this concept of everything everywhere. Okay, Maria wanted to do the, the original idea, or not wanted to do, but suggested, let's, let's say suggested. Uh, to do them in bit, you know, five in year one, five in year two. Okay. So I thought, well, Marie's a superwoman. She can do the whole lot in <laughs> together. Yeah. And um, so we had 32 fa uh, families to be tested with 65 trees. We wanted controls to be tested in every environment with eight trees. This is all my, my proposal, but not, not necessarily the right one. 32 test families to be tested in, with 66 trees. Well, there's not a lot of difference in the, in the resource allocation in this design, okay? But nevertheless, um, there's, there's, uh, there's a difference. And it's small, but you may as well take advantage of it. 
you might as well choose, optimally choose, which, which females to give 50, 65 to and, and which ones to give 66 to. In my world, that difference is, is usually much more drastic. Sometimes it's down to one and sometimes it's up to 50. Okay? And, and that's the reality of it. That's the reality. If you use every bit of germplasm you've got available, that's what happens. And that's where ODW, I think, helps enormously. As you saw in the previous slide, using relatedness in terms of determining uh, resource allocation really, really plays a big role. Um, plot structure within each environment is written in ODW syntax as blocks, uh, sorry, plots within, incomplete blocks within blocks, okay, within environments. <laughs> so nested, uh, nested structure. I've assumed there'll be six blocks, roughly. No reason, why, no magic reason why I chose six, obviously. 25 incomplete blocks and 16 plots. Okay, so that's my design within an experiment, which is the boring part of it. I find that bit boring, okay? Because by then you've done all the important work. The last stage, which is like alpha design, is a little bit boring. And it doesn't really have a big impact, it would seem. Okay? But nevertheless, you may as well do it. Okay, this, this is ugly. All right? I'm sorry about that. But basically, Alison dodged uh, algebra, and I wish I had dodged algebra. However, we need to put context here. And so, in, one of, in a paper I wrote in 2014 with uh, a, a good, very good friend of mine, Paul Jefferson, who's now deceased, sadly, he was the guy who got me into uh, analysing uh, ray out of pine data and, uh, and doing MET analyses. And so we have a reduced animal model for a MET. I mean, it's just the standard, it's just the, what's in that paper, if you want to read it. 24,000 observations, uh, environment effects, additive, uh, additive genetic effects for the parents uh, within environments. And then we've got the tree effects. We've got the Mendelian, we've got the non-additive, and then we've got these, you know, block effects for each environment and that sort of stuff, and the, the vector of errors, all right? Now, I'll skip that because that's too much, all right? All I want to do is basically come down to this more simple model, which is essentially putting all those things that we, uh, which are confounded, okay, is a, is, that's an error term, and I've got a mum and dad, I've got a mum and dad term, and I've got plot effects. The factor analytic structure comes into this between environment uh, variance covariance matrix, okay, and that's that's very important in what I what I'm going to do next is that the parallel model-based design requires knowledge of the form and values of the variance models for the random effects in this model. A priori, it's not sensible to use the full variance model, which in a factor analysis means that you need to know the loadings and the, and the genetic variances at each site. A priori, you don't know which site's going to be more variable. You don't know which one's going to have the higher genetic variance. So what you do is you start, start off with a flat prior. You start off with a simple assumption where you say, let's fit an FA1 where we've got a main effect and we've got an interaction term, and we actually cheat or give up, or whichever you want to say, and we model this GA by the, by the old-fashioned G plus G by E model. This is, a, this is, this is the, only sense, the only thing that's sensible to do, I believe, at the design stage. You need a flat prior, you don't really know what's going to happen going forward, and you assume that the error variance is also uh, equal across in environments. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily change how good this concept is in terms of finding a better design, it just makes it more sensible. Here we have three stages, sometimes four, okay? The first stage is allocating um, trees, uh, you know, the allocation uh, of the status, the seedling status to families. Stage two, which is absolutely critical, critical one in my world, is to find the best allocation using relatedness of families to environments. And this is where the sparse MET idea comes in. This sparse MET idea um, is really critical in my world and, and it can be critical in your world, not in this example, because Marie's in the luxurious position of being able to do a complete MET, complete, complete uh, connectivity, okay? So you're in a really good space. However, we can still use ODW to determine which trees have six reps at, at one site and which have seven reps at one site. And so you can use ODW to optimally do that, and it does. And stage three is just the boring thing. It just generates all in one hit because a MET is one experiment. It's not 15 experiments. You don't do 15 runs of, of alpha or whatever you want to do. You do one run with ODW using the f as close to the full model as you can and you find an optimal allocation of plots to uh, families with the environments. Okay? Uh, I won't go through that because it's all the same stuff. Here we have, we have um, three levels of TSS, either the controls, and then two, two levels of uh, variance heterogeneity for the uh, test families, and the test families are in row one, the, fam the controls are in family two, in row two. 
three levels of, um, he of variant heterogeneity, as, as I said, 80, 66, 65, and the permute factors are families, again. Um, and then we do the last stage, oh sorry, we do stage two, which is then allowing ODW to find an optimal allocation, because I'm almost up, I'm, uh, I'm getting close, aren't I? Yeah, okay. I'll skip that, but basically it can be done. Anybody who's interested, I'm sure I'll be able to show you the code and we can talk about it. But basically what we're doing is we're moving things around across, across the MET to make sure that we have um, optimal allocation of replication within sites for each family, given that each family will occur at, at every environment. Okay. And the last one is where we fit the whole thing and we determine the allocation, but we do it for the moment without VEI interaction. However, we can bring that in. All right, concluding remarks. Have, de have demonstrated that there's really big gains to be had, I believe. And I've done that on the simulation here. I did a little toy example to show that. The potential gains are in, uh, well, the, in the increases in genetic gain from using these designs, I think is gonna be quite, it is quite phenomenal. We've been doing it now back home. The breeders absolutely love it. Um, yeah, we, just, we, gen we work with so many colleagues who are just besotted with these, these uh, designs uh, with ODW. We've got a paper in prep. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Thank you so much. Th thanks so much, uh, Brian. I think we have uh, two, three minutes for questions. Is there? Um, I, I know because I heard this yesterday, but can you explain the phantom parents? I'm sure a few people may have missed that. Well, phantom parents, uh, it's this concept in this paper by Will I Can Read, and I, don't, I really don't, I hadn't seen it before, but basically, very simple, and Marie, you might be best here, because you, 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 you explained it yesterday in the workshop, and you said, like, the females were collected from an origin, and so if they come from an origin number one, then her parents, her parents become PP1. Her, her mum and dad become PP1, and then if there's a female that was, uh, whose origin was two, then her parents are PP2 and, and PP2. And that, that brings in, um, a, well, it's sort of like a genetic group, I suppose, but, 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 it, but it's a random effect. So the Wallach and Reed paper bring in really neat ways of avoiding singular A matrices by not treating genetic groups as fixed effects but as random effects. So it's quite, quite, quite neat, um, you know, I believe. Yeah. But it brings in the relatedness. The, the level of relatedness in this data set is still very low. It's only about 0.2 on average. But you still see quite big gains using ODW. Doing these things in, an, in a more informed manner does seem to make a big difference. The, the, the relatedness factor in the uh, plant breeding world that I live in in Australia, the relatedness is very high, very high, and complicated. Um, is this on? Yes. Um, so I just I had a couple, I had a lot, few questions, but I'll just limit it to two. Um, one is, what if you have a uh, so you, you in your nursery you have your seedling inventory and maybe you sowed seventy seed per family, but you know you end up with many of them have seventy and then. Some have 69, 68, all the way down to two or three. Um, what, here you just described using like two numbers. Um, I think it was 24 and 12. Or, but c could you potentially put that as input? I was talking to Trevor and, and the rest of the guys at the workshop yesterday, and I, and I said, look, in my real world, I have like maybe from one to 20, or one to 50, you know, and every, every silly damn variety's got different numbers of seeds. And I don't want to waste a seed. I said, I don't want to waste one of them, you know what I mean? It's like every one is critical, because that's your, that's almost like your, um, you know, your standard. You don't want to lose a family. What, you know, what? That's genetic diversity. So, like, I can, it handles anything. It handles whatever okay. you sit down and map out. So the second thing, that's good to know. Thank you for clarifying that. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, the no, other sir. thing is, a lot of times, after we've printed the pot stakes that have the rep row and, and column location, the inventory will change. Somebody dropped a seedling or it broke. Um, it'd be nice if there was like a backup list. So what we do now is we go, okay, we'll plant the family that has the uh, leftover seedlings and the least amount of replication. But then you find out that one of the parents is used in 
many other crosses. So you say, well, maybe I should get one where the parents aren't replicated, and it becomes a, a gray area. Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I, I, I know that happens in, in, in my world um, because um, the annual breeders, well, they, just, they just do it on the fly because it does, in the, you know, it doesn't matter so much for them because it's a single year test, if you know what I mean. And like with forestry, I just, I just can't believe how important it is to do this properly. I was just, we had this chat yesterday. I can't believe how nervous I would be if I was setting up something for someone in 20, 15 years. Do you know what I mean? I would really want to do my best to get it right. And I, and, you know, I, I haven't thought that problem through. I don't know the solution. It's a really good question. We can talk about it later. But I just think that at the moment, we, we should be just respectful of, uh, well, I'm sure you guys are, of doing the best you can. Uh, so, you, so you set up something that's not going to be um, having Trevor pull his hair out when he's putting together a MET, a met data set, which has got terrible levels of connectivity for no one. No one's, root, no one's at fault here. But, but do you know what I mean? Like now we know a bit more about what we're doing. Um, it, it's good to try and do, do that better, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I just think it, designs here now are so much more important almost than, than what we do back, you know, in, back in my, my world. I mean, design's critical. It's fundamental. And it's fundamental to think of it as a single experiment, not 15 more experiments, if you know what I mean. That's, that mentality I'd like, if you get anything out of today's talk, I think there's two things. There's resource allocation, and the fact that we can do incredibly flexible things using relatedness, and the other thing is, is basically connectivity. Numbers of families and connectivity. I was, we were having this chat with Marie yesterday. And this replication within sites is a bit of a, bit of a fallacy. 24 within sites, Marie is still nervous, and we're still having this, this debate. Oh, I don't, want to, I don't want to have six per, per site. I'm nervous, I'm nervous. They're gonna die. I said, well, so what? I said, so what? They're everywhere else. You know, it is what it is. Um, you still got 120 trees, so it's a single experiment. Like, don't, don't get fixated on that side. It's, a, it's one experiment. So the total number of trees doesn't change. It's just the way you do it. And I think that's a really important thing that we can have a really good conversation over a beer or a wine over. But, but I believe that's critical because GYE exists. We all know it exists. We've got to deal with it. And statistically, you deal with it by having a bigger divisor in the GE. The bigger divisor means that you've got better accuracy on your, on your overall effects. And the percent variance accounted for in the, over, in the first factor in all the analyses that we've looked at over all, our, all of our years tends to be 50 to 60% main effect. Okay? Doesn't matter whether it's trees or wheat or barley or whatever. <laughs> it's around about, it can be high as 60 yeah. or 70, but sometimes down to 40, but it's yeah. always strong. Okay? And I think that's a really key uh, principle too, which is really, really good because we can make, take advantage of it here. I really good in discussion. I think we should um, postpone this. Thanks uh, again, Brian. Just ha let's have a class for Brian. So we're so lucky to have Brian and Allison here join us all the way from Australia. And here we're sending you back with some, some really exciting stuff. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brian. Right. Thank you, Appreciate Dan. it. OK. Our next, uh, our next session is another concurrent session. We're a little bit behind time, so I'm just going to ask the moderators to keep track of your session and your timing to make sure that you can, we can line up our talks. Um, this session runs straight into the poster session. So as soon as we're done the concurrent sessions, there'll be coffee and sweets. And please browse the posters. They're in the Okanagan room just, just outside of the other, the other, uh, the other ballroom. Um, and then after that, we'll get back on schedule for our next plenary speaker. So enjoy.